Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. My obeisance is. So, can we begin? Yeah? Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksuruni Kurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutivedamine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shachakindu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanu Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atva Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Rama Rama Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study Srimad Bhagavatam on the third canto Chapter number 21 this evening. And Kardama. So, chapter 20, we heard conversation between Maitreya and Vidura. And Vidura was anxious to hear more pastimes of the Lord. So, The line of Swayam Bhuvamanu. Swayam Bhuvamanu has two very famous sons. Do you remember the names of the sons? Swayam Bhuvamanu? Sorry? Priyavrata and Uttanapada. Priyavrata and Uttanapada. Right. And then he has three daughters are? Takuji, Devoti, and Prasanti. Yes, right. <clears throat> so the rest of this canto, we're going to hear it in this, the end of this chapter, the end of this uh, canto, we hear about her illustrious son, who's the incarnation of Godhead, Lord Kapila. All right, so uh, Vidura as text number one, the line of Swayam Bhuvamanu was most esteemed, O worshipable sage. I beg you, give me an account of this race whose progeny multiplied through sexual intercourse. So the, the, the third canto onwards, we'll hear about Devahuti. And then in the fourth canto, you'll hear, and then the fifth canto, we'll hear about Priyavrata. And uh, then the two, the Prachuti and Akwa. One of the sisters is married to Daksha. And, and what happens to the other one? Ruchi, Ruchi, brother. Ruchi. Pari, uh, Prachetas. Ruchi, Ruchi. Ruchi. Who is he? He is a Prajapati. One of the Prajapatis. Okay. Yeah. Okay, very good ruled the world, seven islands, according to religious principles. Text number three, O Holy Brahmana. In other words, who is the Holy Brahmana? O Holy Brahmana, sinless one, you've spoken of his daughter, known by the name Devahuti, as the wife of the sage Kadama, the Lord of created beings. And so, yeah, we're, we're hearing, first of all, uh, this is Vidura speaking to Maitreya. So, Maitreya is a Brahmana, and he's asking, Vidura wants to hear about Devahuti. How many offspring did the great yogi beget through the princess, the princess meaning the daughter of Swayambhuvamanu, Devahuti, who gets married to Kadama. Nine daughters and one son. Right, nine daughters and one son. One son, who is the incarnation of Godhead. All right. 
So we're going to hear about Kargama Muni here. Text number five, they talk about Ruchi and Daksha and how did they generate children after securing as their wives the other two daughters of Swayambhuva Manu, as we just heard, once married to Daksha and once married to Ruchi. So they're both Prajapatis and they both produce children. Okay, text number six, the great sage Maitreya replied, commanded by Lord Brahma to beget children in the world. The worshipful Kardama Muni practiced penance on the bank of the river Saraswati for a period of 10,000 years, right? For someone to practice yoga, 10,000 years. Which age is this taking? Usually live in Satya Yuga. One lakh years. Yes, they usually live for one lakh years. So, 10,000 years, one tenth of their life. Prabhupada writes in the purport Therefore, yoga practice can be successfully performed by persons who have a very long duration. So, in that way, it is possible to have perfection in yoga. Now, what's the process recommended in such a yoga? Meditation. Meditation, right. So, they're doing Astanga Yoga. What's the difficulty in doing Astanga Yoga? What's the difficulty for us today? Oh, we don't live for so long. Thus, we don't have bodily strength also. We don't have bodily strength? How about... Yeah, we don't have that strength and that concentration. Yeah, mind, we don't have the mental strength, right, to meditate, to sit and meditate, to sit, just to get people to, <coughs> to get people to sit for half an hour, you're doing well. So what to speak of, get people to go for 10,000 years, all right? Any well, other? Maharaj, can I ask one question? I know this, this has been asked 1,000 times. But, um, I mean, at that time, Harinam uh, Sankirtan was also there, as I understand, all, that, all the yugas that was already existent. So why did they take, oh, because they didn't want a simple thing to do, that's why they were doing meditation. They could have just chanted, even at that yoga, right, and easily done yes. Oh, practice. <coughs> yes, they could have chanted. But people like to do something, they feel well, it's, not, not, it's not very challenging for them. Anyway, they generally they look more towards meditation. It's a done thing. It was a done thing in the Satya Yuga. It's what people do, you know, to chant the holy name. It just wasn't common. People like to do what everybody does. They like to, don't like to be too different, you know. They like to see what they're doing is popular, is it, the recommended thing. And so meditation was in sway. People all did it. Meditation, go off and meditate. But in the, our age, very difficult. Even to find a place where you could go and meditate for that very difficult to go to the forest, practically the forests are all destroyed. Where could you go? Not very easy. So the mental powers are not there, the concentration, the ability to absorb our mind and the, the detachment which is required to go away from the world alone to sit in some remote place without thought of anybody else. Very, very rare soul who could perform that kind of yoga. And so even in the Satya Yuga, the people who are doing it, they're very great souls. Like Kardama. Kardama is going to be described 
Who is, Kad who is the father of Kardama? Lord Brahma. Yes, right. He's born from the body. He's the direct son of Lord Brahma. And so he's, he's, he's not an ordinary person. He's a very great soul. And he, he could do it. Nowadays you get so much commercial meditation. Prabhupada writes in the purport, he says, people think 15 minutes a day <laughs> they can attain God. They can become one with God by meditating for 15 minutes a day. It's ludicrous, just not possible. And similarly with chanting the holy name, you know, we have to really chant. We have to chant regularly. And we, we have, there's, you know, look at what people did in the times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. They were chanting, well, everybody was chanting one lakh names, 64 rounds. And you have Haridas Thakur, three lakh names. And we chant, we struggle, 16 rounds, we struggle. Anyway, this is a process. In the Kali Yuga, there's no other way but the chanting of the holy names. And we have to develop a taste for that chanting. Okay. Yes. Actually, yes, I have a question. If somebody chants more rounds than the Bhagavatam and performing other activities, he will obtain the same benefit? as he is performing by engaging in other different activities? Well, it depends what he's doing. It depends what these other activities are. Are they in relation to Krishna, Krishna's service? Yes, Maharaj. But well, suppose an example, suppose I am... Suppose I am taking... I'm chanting 16 rounds, completing in uh, one and a half an hour, and then half an hour I'm engaging in reading Bhagavatam. Suppose I will completely dedicate two hours for chanting only without reading Bhagavatam and other prescribed devotional activities. Is it right? Well, mm, it's, it, it's not wrong directly, but it's, it's important for us to hear Srimad Bhagavatam. It's an, it is important for us to hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. Ideally, you should go to a class and hear the Srimad Bhagavatam. That's the morning program. We do need to hear. If you don't hear the scriptures, then after some wonder the importance of chanting. So it is important for us to hear the philosophy. If you just chant all the time, you see, we, we cannot imitate someone like Haridas Thakur. We need to understand why we're serving Krishna. We have to understand the theology of the Holy Name. It's important for us to have some quality in our chanting. Now, if you don't hear Srimad Bhagavatam, you just chant, then you may not understand the proper theology behind You may not understand why you're chanting. there, along with Japa as well. Okay? Yes, Father, thank you. Okay, text number seven. We hear Dhamma created the personality of Godhead. So, it was a yoga process for 10,000 years. So, is it is it, does it mean he's a great, he's really a pure devotee? Is he really pure? Well, Prabhupada writes in the purport, he's writing purport text number seven. In this age of Kali, the direct method is especially more feasible than the indirect because people are short living. Their intelligence is poor, and they are poverty-stricken and embarrassed by so many miserable disturbances. Lord Chaitanya, therefore, 
has given the greatest boon in this age. One simply has to chant the holy name to attain perfection in spiritual life. So Prabhupada has highlighted the difficulties in the age of Kali. Short life, poor intelligence, poverty stricken, and embarrassed by many miserable disturbances, so many disturbances. So this is, this is our problem, you see. We don't have a lot of wealth, we're not very intelligent, we don't have a long life. What can we do? Well, we can chant the holy name. That is the best thing we can do. And that is what Krishna wants us to do in this Kali Yuga. So that is the direct process, simply chanting the holy name. Chanting the holy name is a means to perfection and it is also perfection also. When we achieve perfection, we'll continue to chant the holy name. There's nothing after chanting the holy name. Maharaj, yeah? why is it so why is it said embarrassed by so many miserable, miserable disturbances? What does it mean? Well, it means, you know, there, do you, you don't have any disturbances in your life? You know, usually family oh, life... I have fam but I'm not embarrassed by it. Well, if other people know about all your disturbances, you know, people come and see you, all the disturbances going on. Sometimes, you, you know, you go to someone's home and the family, you know, they're all arguing with each other. You know, the wife's shouting at the husband and the husband's shouting at the kids and the kids are crying and, oh my goodness. And, you know, you go to the, you go to the home and you think, oh my goodness, what's going on here, you know. It, 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 they should be embarrassed. Maybe we're... Oh, okay, excellent. <laughs> Got it, Maharaj. I understand that. Yes, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes, you know, we, we don't notice it. We think, oh, this is part of life. This is normal. <laughs> Family life. Constant battling and arguing and intrigues and politics and oh, so many troubles. So many difficulties, disturbances. Okay, going ahead, text number nine or oh, eight here. So, talking about the Satya Yuga, the lotus eyed Lord being pleased, appears to Kardama Muni and displays his transcendental form, which can be understood only through the Vedas. So, this is the greatness of Kardama Muni that the Lord personally appears to him. And it, it's not just some fictitious thing which he imagines in his mind. The Lord actually came there personally in his form. And the, the form of the Lord is described. It's not just some concoction. The, the Lord is described. His eternal form, a god, how he's decorated with a garland of white lotuses and water lilies and spotless yellow silk, his lotus face and his slick dark locks of curly hair, adorned with a crown and earrings. He holds his characteristic conch, disc and mace in three of his hands and a, a white lily in the fourth. No lotus flower, <laughs> he only has a white lily. <laughs> he glanced about in a happy, smiling mood, whose sight captivates the hearts of all devotees. And he, his uh, lotus feet are placed on the shoulders of Garuda. So we should understand the nature of the form of the Lord that the Lord is a person and although he's transcendental, he's not an ordinary material person who's going to grow and his body is transcendental, but he has a body and he has a form and he has a dress 
and he gives instructions and he speaks words. We have to understand the nature of the Lord. And Prabhupada writes that the perfection of yoga is attained when one actually sees the personality of Godhead in his eternal form. This is the perfection of yoga. We, we, we have, of course, we heard about this. Uh, in Brahma Samhita it's described like that I worship Govinda, the primeval Lord, who is Krishna, Sham Sundar himself, with inconceivable, innumerable art attributes, whom the pure devotee sees within the heart of heart, with the eye of devotion, tinged with the salve of love. So one yogi sees the Lord in the heart, but here Kadama Muni, the Lord appears directly in front of him. So at the end of the purport, text 11, Prabhupada writes, these descriptions are authoritative and a Krishna conscious person takes them directly. He acts on them, preaches them and practices devotional service as enjoined in the authoritative scripture. So Prabhupada is describing the behavior of the devotee, how we carry out the Lord's instructions. Maharaj, mm -hmm. the, so he saw Lord Vishnu, right? Yes. So generally uh, we hear he's uh, having lotus in his hand. Even uh, previously we read uh, with Jai Vijay that he came with lotus in his hand. So why is it mentioned lilies? Is that any significance of that? <laughs> yeah, I also wonder about this myself. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know the, the mind of the Lord. Okay, I don't Thank know how, how to answer. And sometimes, and sometimes it, may, it may be just described as a lily, but it may actually be a lotus flower. It, We'd have to ask Prabhupada, you know, there's so many questions we could ask Prabhupada, Prabhupada would come back, you know. If we could ask him all these things, you know, Prabhupada, why did you say this? Is it actually there in the verse? Or is it just in the, in the purport? No, it's in the verse, white lily. Yeah, it's mentioned, uh, uh, Sweta Utpala. The Sweta Utpala. In text number six, number ten, Sweta, of course, meaning white, and Utpala is the word for lily. So, <laughs> maybe Lord liked uh, lily at that day, <laughs> on that day. <laughs> yeah. Well, it indicates to us that there is variety there in the spiritual world, and the Lord can carry these different things. He can vary as he likes. So Kardama Muni is so fortunate, the Lord has appeared directly before him. So the Lord comes in front and Kardama Muni falls on the ground, bowed to offer obeisances. His heart full of love of God and with folded hands, he satisfied the Lord with prayers. So Kardama Muni is going to offer his prayers to the Lord and he will describe about the futility of material desires. <laughs> interesting enough, and it's an interesting thing that Kadama Muni is going to condemn materialistic people who worship the Lord to get something material. Anyway, first of all, Kadama Muni glorifies the Lord, said, The power of my sight is now fulfilled, the greatest perfection of the sight of you, the reservoir of all existence. So Kadama Muni is appreciating his good fortune to actually see the form of the Lord. And then text number 14, we read about the Kadama Muni offering further glorification that 
by the mercy of the Lord, you can cross over the ocean of mundane nations. And then he talks about people under, he said, only persons, this is text number 14, only persons deprived of their intelligence by the spell of the deluding energy will worship those feet with a vision to attain the trivial and momentarily, momentary pleasures of the senses, which even persons rotting in hell can attain. However, O oh my Lord, you are so kind that you can bestow mercy even upon them. <laughs> so, Kadarma Muni is condemning people who worship the Lord for material desires. And Prabhupada talks, Bhagavad Gita describes two kinds of devotees. Those who desire material pleasures and those who simply desire devotional service. So those who worship the Lord for material pleasure, of course, they're not pure devotees. Material pleasures can be obtained even by the hogs and the dogs. And, and, and Prabhupada talks about the modern yogis. He says, modern yogis advise that because one has senses, one must enjoy to the fullest extent, like cats and dogs. Yet one can go on and practice yoga. So, of course, that's the modern yogi philosophy. Modern, the, the, the cheaters, they will encourage like that and mislead the people in the name of yoga. Oh, yes. <laughs> so if, so if you go to a yogi and tell him, I want to practice celibacy, he'll tell you, oh, oh, oh listen, you know, just do tantra yoga. It's much more fun. And then the yogi will say, me and my wife, you know, we just do tantra yoga. <laughs> and he talks about how he, how they do the yoga. So this, this was an experience, actually. One of our devotees, he went up there to uh, Rishikesh to get some yoga asana, get some advice on yoga. And he asked the yogi, like I said, I want to practice celibacy. I want... And the yogi would say, oh, no, no, forget about celibacy. Just do tantra yoga. So it's very common, modern yogis. They say, oh, you have senses, you have to satisfy your senses. So this is condemned by Kartama Muni. He says, material pleasures available even for the hogs and dogs or the cats and dogs. And yogis shouldn't be thinking like that, right? Maharaj, I have one question. Uh huh. <laughs> one of the earlier verses, Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. In verse number seven, it is in the translation said that Kardam Muni worshipped through devotional service in trance. So, how can one perform devotional service in trance? He may be practicing Ashtang Yoga. So, how is uh, performing devotional service? through that Ashtanga Yoga? By meditation. He was meditating on the form of the Lord. Fixed his mind on the Lord. Yes, Maharaj. So there is, is there no activity involved in that? It's like serving through men, at the mental platform? Well... Like a Brahmana in South India cooked uh, uh, sweet rice in his mind. Uh -huh. Is this is, is it related to that, Maharaj? Well... That's definitely a more advanced kind of yoga, but generally the people doing Astanga yoga, they meditate on the super soul. So the meditation on the super soul, they're not actively engaging in any activity. They're just simply remembering the Lord. It's just simply remembering the Lord, which is also part of bhakti yoga. Yes, Maharaj. 
so that they are able to do only because they got association of some pure devotee otherwise other yogis are not able to achieve this platform well uh, Kardama Muni of course he's the son of Brahma so he had some association from his father he definitely must have had some association somewhere how did he know how to do Astanga Yoga and yes. for the Satya Yuga you know he's going off to do his meditation you have to meditate what do you meditate on you have to have an object of meditation it's not that make the mind blank but you fix the mind on the form of the Lord and Prabhupada says very clearly, this is the purpose of meditation. You fix your mind on the form of the Lord. You don't think just about serving the Lord. That's a, that's a much, that's bhakti. That's actual devotional service. That is seva. But this is meditation. So remembering the Lord. You're remembering. You're yes. contemplating the Lord. And this described later when you come to uh, Kapila Shiksha, uh, chapter number 29, I think it is, or 28, describes the different uh, stages of Astanga Yoga and how the yogi meditates on the different limbs of the Lord and contemplates the different features of the Lord from his lotus feet up to his lotus face. Yes, yes, Maharaj. So his meditation is definitely different from that meditation of an impersonalist, oh. like the four Kumaras. Well, the four Kumaras, you know, they also become devotees. Later, yes, the, Maharaj. The devotee, they're in Shantaras. The four Kumaras are in Shantaras. In Shantaras, it means they appreciate the opulence of the Lord, but they don't actually engage in any service but they're attracted by the opulence. Yes, ma'am. For example, the beauty. The beauty of the Lord is very captivating. And the four Kumaras were very captivated when they saw the Lord. They appreciated. They immediately gave up the contemplation of the impersonal Brahman and became devotees. Yes, ma'am. So that, that kind of meditation, it, 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 it is very close to devotional service. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so Kardama Muni has uh, been meditating like that and he's offering his prayers and he's describing about these people who worship the Lord just for satisfying their material senses. Uh, they, in other words, people are so attached to sense gratification that even when they worship the Lord, that they'll go to the Lord and they'll ask Him for sense gratification. And Prabhupada gives an example, he said, just like there's a story about the old lady who was carrying a basket of wood on her head and she was going to the market to sell the wood to get some money so she could maintain her life. She would collect dry wood in the forest and she'd make it into a bundle and then she'd go off to the market and sell it. So one day she had a big load of wood on her head but somehow she tripped and all the wood fell down. So then she prayed to the Lord. She prayed to the Lord, please come, please help me. And the Lord came, the Lord appeared in front of her and so when the Lord appeared, what did she do? She asked the Lord, can you help me put this wood on my head? <laughs> and so Prabhupada said like that, this is, this is like materialistic people. They may worship the Lord and they may ask the Lord for something material. It's like this woman who asking God, help me put the wood back on my head so I can go to market and sell it. Now the Lord has actually appeared to you. You don't need to ask him to put the wood on your head. So materialistic people are very foolish. They worship the Lord just to get more trouble, to be more involved, more entangled in the material world, instead of thinking how to get free from the world. This is also discussed in the 11th canto, you have Vasudev. 
Vasudev, the father of Lord Krishna, that he regretted that he didn't take advantage of Lord Krishna to get liberation. Instead, he simply had Krishna as his son. Then he never thought to get liberation, to get out of the material world. And so he lamented like that, that he wasted his opportunity. So we should understand what is the actual goal. The goal is not to get material desires fulfilled. But at the same time, Kardama Muni, although he's criticizing people like this, he himself has some material desires. As we will see when we go on in the chapter, Kadama Muni has also material desires. So it's described in, chap in text number 15. He describes, he said, Therefore, desiring to marry a girl of like disposition, who may prove to be a veritable cow of plenty in my material life, to satisfy my lusty desire, I too have sought the shelter of your lotus feet, which are the source of everything, for you are like a desire tree. So Kardama Muni describes his own situation, that he wants, he wants to marry a girl. Now, of course, we have to understand Kardama Muni is acting also in the mood of devotional service because he had been ordered by his father, Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma wanted Kardama Muni to help him to do what? To beget children. Yes. He wants him to propagate, help him to fill up the universe. Because Brahma has that purpose, that's one of his missions. He has to populate the universe. So he had these different children himself. Like Manu and Satarupa, they have to do that. And then similarly here, Kadama also. Kadama also has to. Have and of course, we know the four Kumaras, they refused. And that, wasn't, that was not pleasing to Lord Brahma. So Kadama, you could say, he's acting according to the order of his father. And so that's, that's, you know, that's duty. One should... One should be obedient to the order of the superior. Lord, what does it mean by veritable? A veritable cow of plenty. A ver what does it mean, veritable? Uh, mm, veritable. I, I'd have to... Is it various? No? Huh? Is it various? It, usually it means... Tr a truly, a really, you know, veritable cow of plenty. Actually, it's going to be factually a cow of plenty, veritable. Hmm? What do you say, Ram Ram Ramanya Prabhu? How do you understand the meaning, veritable? He's, he's indicating that, you know, it's not just a figurative or imaginative description, but it was... It's actually a, cow, a fact. fact. Factually, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah. I didn't understand the meaning of the sentence. <laughs> so, first point anyway, he wants to marry a girl of like disposition. So, this is an important point. Like disposition. And Prabhupada discusses that. What does that mean? People of like disposition. How should, how do you understand that? I think later on it says character and taste. Uh, let me see. Yeah, the, it, it is the explained. Uh, Kadama Muni wanted to have a wife of like disposition because a wife is necessary to assist in spiritual and material 
advancement. It is said that a wife yields the fulfillment of all desires in religion, economic development and sense gratification. If one has a nice wife, he is to be considered a most fortunate man. So who is the most fortunate man? And then he mentioned in astrology that there are three different ways in which one can be fortunate. If somebody is very rich, he's very fortunate. And if somebody has good sons, that's also very fortunate. And if somebody has a good wife, that is also very good. So of the three, one who has a good wife is considered the most fortunate. And then Prabhupada explains, before marrying, one should select a wife of like disposition and not be enamored by so-called beauty or other attractive features for sense gratification. So like disposition. In other words, both the husband and wife should be of a similar nature. And when their natures are similar, then they can combine together and work together cooperatively in Krishna consciousness. If they're of unlike disposition, then it would be very difficult to live together and to get along with each other. So this is why Prabhupada is talking about the... Uh, importance that it shouldn't just be based on sexual attraction. There has to be more. There has to be this like disposition, similar natures. The, if the husband is very Brahminical and the woman is a Vaishya, <laughs> it might be quite difficult to get along. Because the woman's always wanting to make money, do business. And the husband's Brahminical, he just wants to do puja, just wants to chant and read the scriptures. So, do you, what, what kind of principles did you follow in your marriage when you got married? Did, did you do, the, did you check yourself? Like, did, did, you, did you check by astrology? Did you see that? You were compatible. Did you consult ast astrologers before marriage? Any of you? Uh, you're asking men, right? Not the woman. Because well, they don't have a skill, right? Well, <laughs> women also can take part, you know? Did you? Yes, did astrological, uh, astrologically it is always uh, matched. I mean, for me also, for my marriage also it was done. Astrologically, yeah? Yes. Was matched. Yes. But Maharaj, it is a approximately, it is quite different. It is an approximation. Astrology does not match in everybody's life. That goes in failure. I'm sorry, you're not clear, Prabhu. Yes, Prabhupada is saying astrology sometimes doesn't match. Oh yeah, I agree. Right. Astrology is not a hundred percent. Definitely. We cannot think just to, you know, because everything's right astro astrologically, so it will all be successful. Um, no. But sometimes it is an indication. Like in uh, Maharaj in Prabhupada's life also, when his father uh, got him married, so they were uh, matched very well, right? Because his father was in favor of this marriage. He insisted. But then um, it seemed at the end that Prabhupada was miserable because she was not having the same mentality like Prabhupada. So it's only gambling, I mean, no matter how much we match, isn't it so? Mm. <laughs> yes, well, uh, yeah, of course there's some risk gamble, yeah. 
Uh, Maharaj, I, I did uh, the astrology for my marriage myself because uh, we were taught astrological uh, science in Guruku. So there was uh, one devotee who I had a 98% match rate, but uh, my spiritual master refused. And instead, he told me to marry someone who I had a lower match rate with. But he, you know, he gave me his permission for that and he instructed me directly. So uh, it turned out that his decision was better than what the astrological calculation had in mind. But we got both the, the sadhu and the guru's approval and the astrology, so combined effort. Okay. And he told me the same thing that uh, Kadama Muni is saying here, like disposition, the nature, the mindset of the person is thinking in the same value system. So you're able to survive for longer periods. Okay, interesting. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know couples, they had very good astrological compatibility, but somehow the marriage didn't work out. So astrology is not everything, not always. It, it can be a, a help sometimes, but it's not 100%. But like this... Can I make a comment? Yes. Oh, please, Ramani Prabhu, please. I was going to say, when I was getting married in 1976, just the, the temple president said, oh, you want to get married? All right, here's one girl. He just selected someone. And um, that was 45 years ago. We're still married. Jai. Mm. Very nice. Oh, wonderful. Marge, with your permission, I just wanted to share one thing that, obviously it's a big topic, but just one thing that um, Bhaktivedya Puramaj shares in this regard. He says, a good marriage is just like having a good kitchen. Just because you have a good kitchen doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a nice dish. But if you have a nice kitchen, you're more likely to make a nice dish. That was all. That you can still have a bad compatibility, a bad kitchen, and still, you know, make it work. So effort is still required, essentially. But um, yeah, this is what I understood from March. <laughs> okay. Very interesting. Vipanya Vishnu may probably want to elaborate. Yes. Anyway, like disposition is certainly important. I think before, my, what could we say an important principle? In my, although, Ramya Prabhu, you said you just married immediately, you and your wife. You didn't spend time to get to know each other. Um, we got to have Prashant together for a couple of weeks and then he asked me, well, what's your decision? Oh, okay. That was his association, uh -huh. nothing more. Uh, I heard that His Holiness Jai Swami Maharaj, he's, he's compiled a list of questions, you know, maybe about a hundred questions. And he encourages couples, prospective couples thinking of marriage, that it's a good idea for them to go through these questions and work through these questions with each other and get to know each other and understand each other. And that way, then they're more prepared for entering into the Grihastha Ashram. But if they try to move too prematurely, too quickly, without properly knowing each other, then it could be more difficult. Unless, of course, you have guidance from, like, parents, if the marriage is arranged by parents, that's also very good. Or, as you say, spiritual authorities who actually know the other person and they can understand your compatibility. Do you agree? Yeah, it seems to be agreeable. Right. 
no matter Maharaj, no matter what my experience is, no matter how compatible it is, everyone has to work uh, hard to make it work. In the, because there will be things which, because we don't know each other also, we are also changing always. So we don't know what we are going to be in that particular situation when that situation arises. Right. Everything seems to be rosy in the beginning, mm. but it's not rosy <laughs> later on. Yeah, of course. There's a lot of challenges. Of course. It certainly is difficult. It has to be, you have to work, you have to be determined. Yes, Maharaj. And then, and then that situation come of embarrassed in the <laughs> real world. Mm. Okay. So... Maharaj, one question from the previous verse. Yes. If you allow me. So you were saying, commenting that... Um, um, Vasudev, Vasudev was also um, uh, did not ask for liberation, so he was lamenting. Yes, that's like in the eleventh canto. Oh, okay. He had Lord Krishna as his son, but he he didn't ask Lord Krishna actually. You know, he he did his austerities to get the Lord as his son. Instead of doing austerity to get out of the material world, he wanted to have Krishna as his son, right? He got the child Krishna as his son three times. Yes. So he later on he re regretted that you know he should have been thinking more about getting out of the material world rather than just having the Lord as his son. But when you have a Lord as the son, you are already liberated. That means you will be liberated, isn't it? So? <laughs> wow. <laughs> He wanted, you know, not to be in the material world. You know, look what happened to Vasudev. He and Devaki, they were in Kamsa's prison house for a long time. And, you know, they did go through a lot, you know. Yeah, but they were continuously meditating on Krishna, right? So they probably, they, they should be liberated, right? They, are, they were, the whole years they spent in just thinking of Krishna and fearing for Krishna. So that is, that's in Vatsalya Ras, they were, you know having that feeling. So, isn't that pure devotional service? <laughs> yes. Well, still, even the pure devotees feel like that. They don't feel like, you know, they're pure devotees. They feel that, you know, they should... <laughs> they did something wrong, you know. They, they think, why I got the Lord, why I just wanted the Lord as my son, thinking like that. We want the son, we want the son, <laughs> want the Lord to be my son. You know, why Why you have to think like that? Better to get, you know, why be in this material world? Get out. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tanas Pranam. Actually, I have a question related to Aditi Mataji's question only. Can I ask? Yes. So generally, pure devotees, they never pray for liberation, no? Like, they only pray for service and to their God. Yes. Generally. But Vasudev, it's, you could say it's Lila, you know? He wants to... Because we may be thinking, you know, people in this world may be thinking, I'll get the Lord as my son. I want the Lord as my son. I want Krishna to be my child. We may fall into that trap. So Vasudev's talking like that. He wants to enlighten us. Not don't be don't be fooled. Don't think that's the goal. He wants us to understand. Get out get out of the material world. Don't just think to have the Lord as your child. That's not Okay, so Prabhupada paraphrases the mind of uh, Kardama Muni that he says, although I know that nothing material should be asked from you, I nevertheless desire to marry a girl of like disposition. 
And then Prabhupada talks about this like disposition. Formerly, boys and girls of similar dispositions were married. The similar natures of the boy and girl were united in order to make them happy. And then Prabhupada talks about consulting astrologers and horoscopes, and you can tell from these th from these things you can tell, you know, particularly it's clear about having children. You can tell from the heart from that when you do the astrological charts, you can understand what the chances are of having children. So. So that's important. And Kadama Muni certainly wanted children. And he wanted a wife of like disposition. You're going to marry someone like Kadama Muni, you're going to have to be of like disposition. You know, look what Devahuti had to do. You're, as we read on, we'll read about Devahuti coming to live with Kadama Muni, to live with her husband in the forest, in his ashram. When she was coming, she was a princess, she was the daughter of Swain Bhuvamano. She'd been living in the palace with her father. And then she left everything to come and live with Kardama Muni in the, in the forest. And so it was really great renunciation on the part of Devahuti to give up everything. And why did she do that? Well, she'd been told by Narada Muni. Narada Muni had, came, had come to her and glorified Kardama Muni, told her about him, and she was attracted. She wanted to marry him. So there was no force. It wasn't like, the, the, you know, nowadays, you know, the girl, she wanted to know, how much money do you have? What, ki what kind of car do you have? <laughs> and. Are we going to have our own home? I don't want to live with your parents, right? They'll say things like this, you know. And you want to have a wife, you know, you have to, you have to be able to, you have to be able to support her. And it's not wrong, you know, women are practical. You know, the woman's going to get married, she wants a man who can support her, who can look after her generally. And so, sometimes some men complain, oh, women, they only want money. But women are practical, they know, well, you have to have money, you're going to get married, you ha you're going to have a family, you have to have home, and you have to have some money to maintain the children. So it has to be practical. You have to be able to support a family. Okay, there's a nice section at the end of the purport of uh, verse 15, Prabhupada writes, The advantages of worshipping the Supreme Person is that even if one has desires for material enjoyment, if he worships Krishna, he will gradually become a pure devotee and have no more material hankering. Hmm? Right? Usually you want to have a good wife, who will you worship? A man wants a good wife, he should worship Uma. And if a woman wants a good husband, who should she worship? Shiva. Huh? Shiva, yes. Lord Shiva. Yeah, you should worship Lord Shiva. I've seen several examples of ladies who worship Lord Shiva and they all have good husbands. It's a very good way to, a very good way to help you to get a good husband. You worship Lord Shiva, but you don't need to worship Uma or Shiva. We can just simply worship the Supreme Lord, just like Kadama Muni. Kadama Muni wanted a wife, he didn't worship Uma. Who is Kardama Muni worshipping? He is worshipping the Supreme Lord. So whether you have, Prabhupada quotes the verse, Akama Sarvakamova Moksha Kama Udaradi. 
Right? If you have all material desires or no material desires or desire liberation, whatever you desire, you should worship the Supreme Lord. Why? Why should we worship the Supreme Lord? What's the benefit? Because He knows what, to, what is good for us. Yes, He knows what's good for us. And ultimately what will happen if we have material desires? He will get purified. He's going to, yes, He's going to purify our desires. Can you think of some examples? Dhruva Maharaj. Yes, very good. That's the obvious example, right? Dhruva Maharaj. He wanted a kingdom, a great kingdom. But when he, when he saw Krishna, when the Lord came there, then he, he said, I don't want anything. I'm fully satisfied. Now I'm fully satisfied. Good? Yes? Any other examples? No? Who? Kardam, Kardama Muni. Kardama Muni. Well, yeah. He, he's going to get his desire fulfilled. And then, well, he's going to get his wife. And they're going to have the family. And then, he's going to leave everything. He's going to go away. Yes. Uh, even Chitraketu Maharaj, I think he was desirous of the sun ah, initially. Yes, good. Yes, Chitraketu wanted yeah, he so. Got the sun. Uh, he got the sun, but later on, like uh, all that didn't happen, and then he realized when his son died. So Narad Muni and Angira Muni gave him instructions, and then he also became devoted to the Lord. Right, yes, very good. Nice example. Okay, going ahead, text number 16, uh, Kadama Muni is continuing his prayers. He said, you are the master and leader of all living entities. Under your direction, all conditioned souls, as if bound by rope, are constantly engaged in satisfying their desires. Following them, I also bear oblations for you who are eternal time. So Prabhupada raises a question in the purport. If you look at the second paragraph of the purport there, text number 16, Prabhupada said, a question may be raised. Since Kadama Muni was advanced in spiritual life, why then did he not ask the Lord for liberation? Why did he want to enjoy material life in spite of his personally seeing and experiencing the Supreme Lord? And Prabhupada answers for us, the answer is not everyone is competent to be liberated from material bondage. It is therefore everyone's duty to enjoy according to his present position, but under the direction of the Lord or the Vedas. So this is an important point that not everyone is eligible for liberation. And Kadama Muni also considered it was important for him First of all, to enjoy, to some extent enjoy, to at least to have an experience of family life, to enter into the Grihastha Ashram and to have his family and to 
have a relationship with his wife, and then later on, then he could renounce. And we, we see this also in relation to the cursing of Yayati. Have you read the story of Yayati and Srimad Bhagavatam? Yayati he had an illicit relationship with the, another woman and so his father-in-law cursed him to become old. His father-in-law was Brihaspati. And so his father-in-law cursed him. Oh, oh, Sukracharya. Thank you, Prabhu. Sukracharya. So his father-in-law cursed him to become old. And so he said to his father-in-law, he said, if you make me an old man, I won't be able to satisfy your daughter and that will be a problem. So Sukracharya was worried about his daughter, so he said, all right, then he said, you can give that curse to one of your sons. If one of your sons will accept it, you may give it to one of your sons, right? And so he asked his sons, and one of the sons said, well, he said, uh, I want myself to renounce the world later on, and so I'm not ready yet to take that curse. First of all, I have to satisfy my senses to some extent, and then only then I could take that curse. But the youngest son, who was called Puru, he agreed, and he, he, he took the father's curse to become old. So although he was the youngest son, he became the heir to the throne of the father. Anyway, the point was the older son, he was justified in refusing the father's desire to take the old age of the father. It was acceptable because he said, I want to first of all enjoy material world and then I will be able to renounce the world. So sometimes this is a problem, people coming into Krishna consciousness if they have not, first of all, satisfied their material desires, uh, somehow material desires again come in the mind, unless one is very strong and very straight in Krishna consciousness, then the material energy can captivate the mind. So Prabhupada explains, conditioned souls who have come to the material world to fulfill their desires to lord it over material nature are bound by the laws of nature. The best course is to abide by the Vedas, by the Vedic rules. That will help one to be gradually elevated to liberation. So follow the rules, follow the Vedic rules. Maharaj, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, so Maharaj, here it is written that not everyone is eligible to go back to uh, to get liberation. So uh, he can, it's everyone's duty therefore to enjoy according to his present position. So uh, a person then uh, comes to his senses, uh, does it come to his senses by getting a bitter experience in married life or something like that? of the material nature or Maharaj is it uh, not like this philosophically? <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it possible to have married life without a bitter experience? <laughs> mm. It may be. It's going to be different for different people. But the point is that we have to understand there are different ashrams and different physical, psychophysical natures. And just like when we're young. So when a young man's body, naturally he will have much more uh, interest in the opposite sex and he will have an interest in thinking about 
a relationship with a woman and married life and having children. Now it's unusual for these things to be there in the older man, older age. Older age, rather we, we should be thinking about, you know, getting out of this body, finishing life, leaving the world. So we have to understand that the nature of the Vedic system, the perfect arrangement of the Vedic system. The, the, the Vedas are there. It begins with brahmachari training. So that's important, that someone wants to be successful in family life. The man should be trained as a brahmachari and the woman should be trained to be chaste. And then they can live together peacefully in Krishna consciousness. If they're not properly trained, then it's going to be more difficult. So the Vedic system is there, brahmachari, then grihastha life, and family life, and then after family life, then there is retirement. And you take up more fully spiritual practice. You move on. So Brahm family life is not eternal. It's not that you remain in family life forever. You have to move out of that family life. You come into vanaprastha, right? We move on into retirement and where we're more dedicated towards spiritual practice. Yes, Maharaj. In some cases, Maharaj, like I think Shabri Muni, he was ultimately frustrated after having 60 wives. Possibly. And he was frustrated that oh, what I have done, I have left my spiritual life and now I am engaging in outsider life. Uh, but in other cases, maybe in Karta Muni's case, he just uh, uh, finished his uh, Grihastha Ashram and then he was uh, fulfilled all his duties and then he was ready to leave. Was he frustrated also? Well, it's not that he was frustrated, but he had already decided at the time of marriage, he told his wife that I will remain with you up until we have children. And then after we have children, then I will renounce. They had completed his purpose of family life. They'd had their children and they got the, ch they got the daughters married and the son was there to take care of the wife. So there was no there was no need of the father anymore. So Kadama Muni wanted to devote himself fully to renunciation. So it wasn't frustration. There was no frustration on his part. Or rather, he had a lot of enjoyment. With his yoga powers, they were enjoying everything possible beyond the imagination. So there was no frustration or disappointment. Yes, Maharaj. And even the children, look at the children. One, ch one ch the son is an incarnation of God. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, this frustration, Maharaj, generally may be coming to a Muni or one who is renounced earlier, like uh, uh, some cases I said. But in other cases, other Mahajans like Manu and uh, uh, Prahlad Maharaj, they were all Vyastas. So they were nev they never re uh, repented later after Vyasta Ashram. But maybe some somebody like uh, Shaubari Muni and something in Bhagavatam we read that later they repented after getting married to what I have done. So why there is such a difference? But I don't know if that he actually repented, but he took Vanaprast. He did take Vanaprast, but the wives went with him also. Yes, ma'am. But it, it was just the Vedic culture, that that's the Vedic system, that after, after Grihastha Ashram, then Vanaprastha. And they went to the forest to do austerities. So that's the Vedic system. It's not question that they had to be frustrated. Just because he becomes vanaprastha doesn't mean he's frustrated. It's a very Maris, uh, Maris, can I say something? Maris. Okay. Maris, uh, as I uh, know, that um, Sauvarman was uh, meditating in, uh, inside that water. So for, um, for 10,000, he was also meditating for 10,000 years. But um, 
by doing some offense to Baruda, uh, then uh, he fell down. He uh, took this material life, of uh, my own family life. That's why he lamented that when he had uh, from 50 wives, 100 sons each. So then he remembered because he, uh, he had uh, did some uh, offense. And uh, by lamentation, that offense was uh, uh, removed. And then only he uh, went to for that one. What did he do to get rid of the offences? He lamented. He lamented? Yeah, Did that get rid of the offences? Um, that's why he um, left his uh, family life and uh, went for a Oh, he didn't actually leave the family life. He took the wives with him. Uh, yes, yes. But it was one person. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'm saying that's a very culture. Yes. Okay. Okay, at the end of the purport, Prabhupada mentions, one should live a life of piety, follow the religious rules and regulations, marry and live peacefully for elevation to the higher status of spiritual realization. So Prabhupada describes nicely there, ideal family life. Life, we should be pious. You have to follow rules and regulations as well. Cannot be just undisciplined or unregulated. And married life is very respectable, very, very honorable. But they should live together peacefully. They shouldn't fight and quarrel like cat and dog, arguing all the time, fighting with each other. They should live together peacefully. Oh, my God. Hare Krishna. Yeah? Yes, Maj, you can try now. Okay. Yeah, go. No. Okay, thank you. Recording in progress. Okay, where did we go? Okay, take seventeen. Seventeen. Kurt Amma describes it, if you take shelter of the Lord, then you can be free from the material necessities of the body. If somebody's in Krishna consciousness, they don't have to depend on any material facilities. So that's a very high level of spiritual advancement to come to that stage to transcend the needs of the material body. Text 18 describes about the time factor and how the devotees of the Lord are not affected by the time factor. <laughs> if we're fully engaged in Krishna consciousness, we don't have to worry about the influence of time. For the devotees, it's not a problem.
and Kadama continues glorifying the Lord, text 19, he gives the example about the spider creating a cobweb by its own energy and again winding up. That example comes several times in the course of Srimad Bhagavatam. Just as the Lord creates the universe and then winds it up, and so it's just like the spider. So the Lord is doing this with the material world. He creates everything and then winds it up. Okay, text 21 describes about Kadama Muni still continuing to glorify the Lord, but giving benedictions to the insignificant, to give all living entities detachment from fruitive activity. You have expanded the material world by your own energy. So, Looking through the purport, Prabhupada describes how to get material enjoyment. So the Vedic system is there. There are different rituals prescribed for material enjoyment. And so people can take advantage of these things, these instructions to enjoy material life. They can even go to higher planets or a noble aristocratic family. These processes are mentioned in the Vedas and one can take advantage of them. And then Prabhupada continues, unless one is disgusted with the enjoyment of this material world, he cannot aspire for liberation. Liberation is for one who is disgusted with material enjoyment. So again, this point is brought up that not everyone is eligible for liberation. You have to be disgusted with material enjoyment. And unless we have enjoyed the material world, we're not going to find that frustration. We know the four goals of Vedic life in the Vedic culture, the four goals of material life, Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. So people only want artha and kama. Everyone wants economic development and sense gratification. Now the Vedic system was that eventually people will become tired of sense gratification and they'll think about liberation. But the problem is it never happens. We never get enough sense gratification. We never get tired of sense gratification. We always want to try more and try more. We never become frustrated. We think, oh, I'll try again. Let me try again. I'll try another time. And it goes on and on, constantly trying to enjoy the material world. We never want to give up. And the, this is a problem. People, they, they talk about the Vedas. But nobody thinks about liberation. All they want is artha and kama. Only think about money and money is for sense gratification. So how will they ever become frustrated? How, how will they ever think of liberation? Unless one is disgusted with the enjoyment of the material world. So to become disgusted with the material world, you have to try to enjoy it, first of all. If you have not tried to enjoy it, how will you ever become disgusted? Do you agree? What do you say? Maharaj, the same point is coming up again. <laughs> but 
Maharaj, everyone doesn't get in, disgusted. I mean, there are people who still think that, oh, it's fine, it's okay, we enjoy it. Well, if they think like that, that's right, they'll never want liberation. I think it has to be done in a mature way, just like if one wants to go to Vanaprast, one needs to progress in that direction in a mature way, and likewise if one wants to take sannyas, that's why um, I think uh, I think it was Lokanath Swami who was giving a class, uh, I forget Marge's name, the person he last gave a sannyas to, Iklavya Prabhu, um, Marge was saying that um, now that they have the sannyas training, ever since the sannyas training has been given, um, I think he said only two sannyasis have fallen down ever since the implementation of that. So there's a bit more maturity involved in progressing. So I just feel, yeah, the maturity and training has to be done. And it's important. Uh, yeah. What about householder training? That too much. Actually, that's the whole point of Brahmacharya Ashram, to get us trained as well. Uh, but please, Chitanya Vishnu Guru, would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, I, I, I would uh, say that the most important, or at least the primal focus should, should be on Brahminical training for all devotees. Because uh, when we don't look at uh, both the spiritual and material aspects, that's when the imbalance comes. So not only spiritual training, but also how much material training do we actually need rather than saying no material training at all. So I think ISKCON has started the new project now where all the ISKCON properties worldwide are going to be, uh, uh, you know, assisted by a ministry that's going to be taking care of all the properties of ISKCON. Something is in the works like that. So, uh, you know, medical associations, educational associations, financial associations to guide devotees. Well, Prabh Prabhupada was not, he did not want centralization of all those things. As a, as a guidance point, Maharaj, not as a controlling factor, like as, like we have the Shastric advisory body, also uh, it's from all over the world, just to give advice to it. Because it's very hard to start certain things in places outside India where there's not such a big population of devotees or support structures, small temples, very few devotees. But they still also need guidance and uh, support in terms of how to develop themselves. So learning from other temples' mistakes, learning from other devotees. So maybe Brahminical training also. Okay. Yes, definitely education is important, but uh, have, we ha I, I'm very cautious about hearing about centralization of everything, of all the properties under one, you know, that's not what Prabhupada wanted at all. And Prabhupada, before he left the world, he put different people, he made trust for each of the different properties, all different people. Yes, Maharaj, I think this uh, initiative by the GBC is uh, like an advisory council for all the, the different trusts that each temple is under, so that they get guidance on property management and everything, but to have something like a collective point where information is gathered and exchanged, something like that. Anyway, I think we're getting away from the, the topic actually, you know, we were talking about the, the ashrams and uh, the nature of family life and coming to the point of getting out of or giving up family life, family life and becoming more eligible for transcendence. Although, of course, family life can also be transcendental. It's not that family life is not transcendental. It depends also, it depends on the devotees. 
the point is enjoy, enjoyment of the material world. If we have that motive to enjoy, if we think the world is just for our enjoyment, that is a problem. We want to give up that enjoying mentality and to have the mood of be, be, being the servant. That is the idea. Prabhupada writes at the end of the purport, 21, one who sincerely loves Krishna and yet wants material enjoyment is in perplexity. Krishna, being very kind towards him, gives him an opportunity to engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. And so he gradually forgets the hallucination. He forgets the hallucination. What is the hallucination? Still wants to enjoy the material world? Yes, right. If we're thinking we can enjoy, how long can we enjoy for? It's going to be very temporary. All right, so then uh, Kardama's finished his prayers. And we hear from Maitreya speaking, and he describes about Garuda and the wings of Garuda are making a nice vibration, right? He said, the sound of the holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, everlastingly increases the enthusiasm of the chanter. If one repeats monotonous material words, he will feel exhausted. But if he chants Hare Krishna 24 hours a day, he will never feel exhausted. Rather, he will feel encouraged to continue chanting more and more. Jai. This is the power of the holy name. So the Lord is replying to Kadama Muni to tell him that, yes, I know your desire, I know what's on your mind, I have arranged everything for you, you've worshipped me well, and I'm pleased with your prayers, and I've arranged everything for you. Prabhupada writes, the personality of Godhead knew the, heart, the heart's desire of Kardama Muni, and he had already arranged for the fulfillment of his desire. He never disappoints a sincere devotee, regardless of what he wants, but he never allows anything which will be detrimental to the individual's devotional service. So then Lord Vishnu continues speaking to Kardama Muni, telling him that everything is very good. You just depend on me. I'm arranging everything for you. You don't have to worry. And he describes, Swayambhuva Manu, the son of Lord Brahma, and he has a daughter. He'll come here with his queen and they'll bring their daughter with you. They'll bring their daughter with them. He has a grown-up daughter and she has character and all good qualities. And she's also searching for a good husband. My dear sir, how suitable for her just to deliver their daughter as your wife. So Prabhupada talks about the importance of parents and the girl is given over by the parents. The girl is not allowed to select her own husband independently. Actually, she heard about him from Narada Muni 
and she thought, oh, he sounds very wonderful. I think he would make a good husband. And the father's coming because her father could understand this Kardama Muni is actually a good man. But the point is <coughs> mentioned here, 28, depending on the will of the Supreme Lord. Prabhupada said, man, dispose, man proposes, God disposes. The fulfillment of desires, therefore, should be entrusted to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the nicest solution. Kadama Muni desired only a wife, but because he was a devotee of the Lord, the Lord selected a wife for him who was the emperor's daughter, a princess. Thus Kadama Muni got a, a wife beyond his expectation. If we depend on the choice of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, we will receive benediction in greater opulence than we desire. Can you think of some examples from scriptures or from our own devotees, maybe from our own devotees in the ISKCON movement? Do you know any devotees? Krishna arranged a wife for them. Nice opulent. I was thinking like Burijan Prabhu. You know Burijan? He was, uh, he was preaching in Hong Kong and China, oh no, Taiwan, he was in Japan, like that, he was in Japan and they came to Hong Kong. And so he wanted to get married, so Prabhupada sent him the, wo the woman, she was an actress, she'd been a world famous actress and she'd been in movies, a very, very attractive young woman and she'd become a devotee. And so Prabhupada sent her, you go there and marry this man. And she did it. And they're still married today. They've been married, must be more than 50 years, husband and wife. And so Prabhupada sent him this, you know, very attractive woman. He was just preaching there in Japan. He didn't have money. He didn't have... But, and then this woman comes and she's a movie star. <laughs> She'd been in, in movies and, and she, he sent her this wife. So I, th I think that's an interesting example, like that. Just like Kardama Muni, he's getting this daughter who's a, the, the daughter of an emperor. She's a princess and she's coming to live with him in his ashram in the jungle. Any other examples you can think like that? Krishna gives you more than what you actually if you just depend on Krishna, then you get what's really right for you. Of course, it's easy to say, it's not so easy to do that, to actually see that this is Krishna's arrangement. That's difficult. Anyway, uh, Lord Vishnu tells Kadama Muni, she will give you nine daughters and through, through your daughters you beget the sages who will beget children. And then the Lord also tells Kadama Muni, that you will finally attain me. That's in text number 30, because he said, with your heart cleansed by properly carrying out my command, resigning to me the fruits of all your acts, you will finally attain to me. So the Lord is telling Kadama Muni, he's going, to, he's going to go back to Godhead, he's going to get success. He just has to follow the instructions do what it's told. He has to marry this girl, they're going to have nine daughters, they're going to do these things. So everything is achieved when you follow the plan of Krishna. So that is surrender. I, 
I like to say one some one something, Maharaj. Yeah. Example <coughs> from my own personal life. Uh huh. Uh, yes, Maharaj. So I had been serving in Sankirtan, and then due to the leaders changing in Sankirtan and my health also not uh, allowing me to go to Sankirtan, I was thinking of getting married. And so I remember once I go to Radha Kund and I prayed very sincerely. Uh, uh, Lord, please arrange somebody so that I can marry and my devotional life continues very nicely. And after two days, <coughs> uh, a mother of one girl called. I am. We are not married yet, but possibly I may be future in we marry. But uh, I see this. Uh, there's a hand of the Lord there. So I was. Hey. <laughs> yes. So was there, Maharaj, in, your, in front of your room also in MI. You came there. Huh? We came to MI there, Maharaj, and you saw us. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, Maharaj. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, uh, the Lord is giving instruction to Kutama Muni about the importance of showing compassion to all living entities. That's important. We want self-realization. We have to we have to be compassionate upon all living entities. And then in the purport, Prabhupada talks about third-class devotees. That a third-class devotee is he doesn't show sympathy to people in general. Nor do they nor do they show respect to other devotees. So he's considered a third-class devotee. As long as one is not compassionate to people in general in his devotional service to the Lord, he is a third-class devotee. So very important to appreciate, to have that compassion, that genuine feeling to want to give, to help others. That's very important in the service of Krishna. The more we have caring and feelings, not just for our own self, but to give Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada always taught, he, when people would say, you know, why you came to America? Prabhupada said, I have not come to beg, I have come to give. So the, we have to have that giving mood in distributing Krishna consciousness. We don't just think about ourselves. We want to give, try to give everything for the service of Krishna. And then Prabhupada talks about being fearless. And this is another important qualification in self-realization. And Prabhupada said, as soon as one becomes a devotee of the Lord, he is convinced that he is protected by the Lord. Fear itself is afraid of the Lord. Therefore, what has he to do with fearfulness? To award fearfulness to the common man is the greatest act of charity. So, of course, a sannyasi, somebody in the renounced order of life, they should be fearless and they should be willing to go everywhere and to distribute Krishna consciousness. They shouldn't be worried, oh, where will I get food, or where will I sleep? No, that's not sin. And Prabhupada showed that example, how he went to America, not knowing anybody, no money, he's in America. It's inconceivable. You're going to a country like America with no money, you don't know anybody, it's just inconceivable. But that is real fearlessness. And devotees should be fearless. We should we, we depend on Krishna. So we have nothing to fear. And then Prabhupada talks about householders also. A person who is a householder but is initiated by a sannyasi has the duty to spread Krishna consciousness at home as far as possible. He should call his friends and neighbors to his house and hold classes in Krishna consciousness. Holding a class means chanting the holy name of Krishna and speaking from Bhagavad Gita. So Prabhupada is describing the duties, everyone, 
different ashrams, you know, sannyasis, they should be fearless and they should be wandering everywhere, distributing Krishna consciousness. And householders, they should have a home, but they use their home to hold classes and to give Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada said, it is the duty of each and every householder to learn about Krishna from his sannyasi spiritual master. The householder's duty is to earn money. A sannyasi is not supposed to earn, but is completely dependent on the householders. Householders should earn money by business or by profession and spend at least 50% of his income to spread Krishna consciousness. I had a discussion about this recently with one devotee where <laughs> I was saying, well, you know, if you live here in Mayapur, if you live here in Mayapur and you have an ordinary job, a common job, say you're working, I met one man, I, I met one man, uh, he told me he was working in a bakery, and so he has a pay, he gets a salary, 8,000 rupees a month. So he has two children and he, has eight, he gets only 8,000 rupees a month. So, could you imagine if you get 8,000 rupees a month, are you going to give 4,000 rupees away and live on 4,000? <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, you can't do it. And so, we have to understand these things in a practical manner. When we talk about giving 50%, you know, 50, that is 50%, that's for the wealthy people. People who are businessmen or so on like that, they may be making a lot of money. So they should give 50% of their profits for Krishna consciousness. But for ordinary people, it's a struggle to live. You know, if you have a couple of children and you're only getting 8,000 rupees a month, you know, school, there's no question of putting them in the international school. But even the national school is very expensive and you have to have a fee to enroll. And he said, I can't do it. He said, my children, he said, every, every day they go to the Navadweep. They go over to Navadweep, to the government school. Yeah, I can put them into the in, in Bhaktivedanta National School. So how can we, you know, when we read these things, uh, we have to understand them 50%. But Maharaj Kolavija Sundar was a example. He was spending... Of course. But we don't hear that he had... I don't know, I never heard that he had wife and children. Maharaj, so I was under... I mean, I heard that uh, we have to... Um, separate the expenses first and then on the whatever is left on that 50% right because like the school as you're saying like school and there might be medical expenses and all so those are the expenses right, right? in from the income if one is giving 50% then uh, probably there will be nothing left you know <laughs> yeah person even for a wealthy person because even a businessman has to continue running his business right so oh, yeah if yeah. he just gives away a full 50 percent of his profit oh I then know. there are other expenses isn't it so? yeah I, I was I was in Dubai one time and I was giving the nectar of instruction course in Dubai and there was you know Dubai people are you know this was before COVID you know people were quite well situated there so I said to you, how many of you give 50%? Uh, are any of you willing to give 50%? And no one agreed. No one said, no. I'm, everybody said, no way. No way we can. It's impossible to give 50%. But, you know, for some, some people do it. You know, somehow, I don't know how, how they manage it. But as I say, you know, if you, especially if you have a family with a wife and children, yeah, and we do find, you know, Prabhupada's quoting here Rupa Goswami, but Rupa's, Rupa Goswami did this when he retired. He didn't do it before retirement. 
It was at retirement. When he actually retired, then he did that. And of course, he was, he was a minister in the state government. So he was, you know, he was like the chancellor of the exchequer. So he was holding all the finances. So he had a lot. Huh? Uh, Maj, can I, can I uh, share something? Yes. So in uh, Gurukul, his name is Bhaktivedi Purna Maharaj taught us that there is uh, various ways that uh, for us young boys to prepare ourselves for Brihastha Ashram. And uh, one, the first method is that anything that we get, we must offer it to Krishna. So even if you buy blankets, you buy a TV screen for the house. So basically your whole income is actually going to maintain Krishna's house if actually the deity is given priority. So that's a hundred percent utility, but that depends on the consciousness. The yes. second he said is that we should start gradually. If you can't give 50%, at least give, at least keep 1% separate from your hundred percent income. And if you can manage 1% this year, then next year do 1.1% or 1.5%. And as you go over time, uh, you can try to increase it and see how you can utilize that directly for Krishna and the other indirectly claiming your house and your life to be, uh, you know, assisting you to go back to God. So you're doing one direct and one indirect. And uh, I've applied that for uh, almost 10 years now. So I started at a certain percentage and I'm starting to try to grow not to 50%, but 100%. So that, that was the way we were taught. And uh, I find it's very practical and useful. Okay, very nice. How much percent are you giving now? Uh, I can say around 15% mm -hmm. after all expenses for okay. the family and, and, and after who, saving who, some money on the side. Who do you give it to? I keep it in a fund and uh, when there's a temple service or something, I remove it from that fund and give it to that service or to help a devotee or to serve, you know, in festivals. Okay, very nice. Wonderful. Yes, I think this, this, some, you made some very nice points there, Prabhu. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate this point about uh, spending for Krishna, that actually maintaining your home because you're devotees and you're maintaining your home, so that is spending for Krishna. You know, you're using everything in the service of Krishna. Your family are devotees and you, whatever money you spend for the, the home, and it, it's all for Krishna. So, uh, I didn't, uh, Maharaj, I didn't hear how much uh, Chaitanya Vishnu gets, how much percentage? He said 15. <laughs> oh, wow, wonderful. I'm yet to reach his standard. 15% directly, 85 indirectly, so 100%. <laughs> wow, yeah, amazing. It, yeah, right, 85% is going in the family, right, for the you know, maintain the family, the children, their education, and you've got to have money for, in case of emergencies for doctors or anything. You never know what's going to come in front of you. As a household of life, you have to have some savings. You want to have something behind you. You never know what's going to come. You Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, can I add one more thing? Yeah. So in my family, uh, I'm the only one working and all three, my mom, my sister and my wife are full-time devotees. Oh. So uh, I normally take it that I am working so I can provide for them to be able to do direct devotional service. So the 85% is actually to support them. And uh, that's, that's how we were taught to, to take Grihastha life. So I found it very practical now after all these years. Okay, thank you Prabhu. All glories to your service. Very nice. Okay, so uh, the Lord is speaking to Kadama Muni. Uh, text 32, he said, uh, I shall manifest my own plenary portion through your wife, Devahuti, along with your nine daughters, and I shall instruct her in the system of philosophy that deals with the ultimate principles or categories. In other words, the Lord's telling him that 
Kapila Muni is going to come in the womb of his wife. And the, it's, a, it's an, an, the plenary portion of the Lord who's going to appear. And so in the purport, Prabhupada talks the distinct, distinction between Swamsha and Vibhinamsha. The Vibhinamshas are the ordinary living entities and the Swamsha is a direct expansion of the Lord. And Kala denotes an expansion from the expansion of the Lord. So Balarama is an expansion and Sankarshan is coming from Balarama. So Sankarshan is Kala and Baladeva is Swamsha. So this way we understand these different uh, expansions. Vibhinamsha, the living entities, the Swamsha, and then the Kala. Having spoken Kardama Muni, the Lord reveals Himself only when the senses and Krishna consciousness departed from that lake called Bindu Sarova. The Bindu Sarova is described, very special water, holy, holy water, came actually from, anybody know the origin of the Bindu Sarova? From the, the tears of from Vishnu. The tear, yes, yeah. yes, from the tear of Vishnu, right. So the tears of Vishnu, not different from the Lord Himself. The, the perspiration from the Lord and the tears from the Lord, they're all non different. They're all of the same spiritual potency. So that water also is described to be very sacred and very powerful. And then this way Garuda takes the Lord away and the Garuda is chanting the Vedic hymns, the Samaveda. And the essence of the Samavedas is the chanting of Hare Krishna. And they leave Kadama Muni there waiting on the banks of the Bindu Sarova and he has to wait for Swayambhuva Manu to come. So after some days Swayambhuva Manu comes there and Swayambhuva Manu has come with his daughter. Why did he come with his daughter? Prabhupada writes here, because he loved her just as a father should. He himself left his state on a golden chariot with only his wife to find her a suitable husband. So that is the real care of the father. Father loves the daughter so much so that he brings her all the way there to get her married to Kardama Muni. And the, they came just at the, the same day in which the Lord told them they, they were coming. And the water of the Bindu Sarova is described. Anyone who drinks the water of Bindu Sarova is cured of all material diseases. And Prabhupada says the same about the Ganga. We get relieved of all material diseases. Go and bathe in the Ganges. And then there's a description about the, the Bindu Sarova and the different birds and the different trees and the, the different flowers and everything which is there, all very pleasing, all very transcendental. The different animals are also described, what kind of creatures are there. And so the em Emperor Swayambhuva Manu has come there on a golden chariot with his daughter and they're coming from the palace and then they see the sage and the sage Kardama is, he's like described like an unpolished gem. And Prabhupada then talks about brahmacharis and how uh, brahmacharis, they should be effulgent, they should be improved in health. 
Prabhupada says here at the end of the purport of text 47, we have actually seen many brahmacharis and grihastas connected with the ISKCON have improved in health and a luster has come to their faces. It is essential that a brahmachari engaged in material advancement look very healthy and lustrous. And then Prabhupada talks about the sage like a gem. So although he wasn't properly dressed, his body was not properly cleansed, but his overall appearance was gem-like. And then we hear about the relationship between the two, the etiquette, how they receive each other. First of all, Kadama is glorifying the king, pleasing him with sweet words. And Prabhupada talks about sometimes how the Kshatriyas will kill animals to practice the killing. So that's sometimes shocking to people to think that, oh, kill animals. But we read Arjuna also, he would have to do that. And Krishna would go and watch because Krishna wanted to see that Arjuna could kill because he knew in the future Arjuna is going to have to fight. So we hear the relationship between the two. Who is more senior? Kardama is senior or Swayambhuvamanu is senior? Swayambhuvamanu is the emperor and Kardama, he's just a, a sage living in the forest. So who, who is senior most? Who should offer respects to who? Kardama Muni uh, is, uh, uh, is a Brahmana, so he should be uh, offered respect. Right, yes. Kardama Muni is a Brahmana, so ultimately should be given respect. But because Swayambhuva Manu is emperor, he's not ordinary. He's a very special Kshatriya. And also, Swayambhuva Manu is in relation to the Lord. He's a great devotee. So that's also important, that Swayambhuva Manu was a great devotee. So Prabhupada does, talks about the failure of the Varnashram system and the problems which were there with the Varnashram how it all became based on birth instead of actual qualities. And he talks about the importance of training. When there is no such training, one simply claims because he's born in a Brahmin or Kshatriya family, he's a Brahmin or Kshatriya, even though he performs the duties of a Sudra. Such undue claims to being a higher caste man make the system of Varnashram, make the system of scientific social orders into a caste system, completely degrading the original system. All right. So the final verse there, describing the etiquette, properly receiving the, the proper reception, that the king has come to the ashram of Kadama Muni. So Kadama Muni also praises him and gives him a nice reception, nice words. And so he's inquiring. I ask you, O king, for what have you come here? Whatever it may be, we shall carry it out without reservation. Of course he knows why he's come, but still it's his duty to inquire like that.
Okay, any questions on this chapter? I have a question, Maharaj. Yes. Uh, in the previous sloka, uh, you were mentioning about uh, when Prabhupada uh, in the, in the Prabhupad mentioned about fearlessness of devotees. So there is, uh, in South India, we see that this is a very common saying that God fearing, they say that we are God fearing now. So um, does it mean that this way, I mean, this fearlessness or, I mean, as we say in Krishna consciousness, fearlessness or God fearing means God conscious. We don't want to be God, we don't just want to be God fearing, we want to be God loving. God fearing means you're just afraid of God, you're afraid of what He will do to you if you don't do. If you don't chant, if you don't get up in the morning, <laughs> oh, I'm afraid Krishna may punish me. So that's God-fearing. You do things out of fear. That's not Krishna consciousness, really. Krishna consciousness is God-loving. Can you understand the difference? Yes, Maharaj. That is what I always used to feel, even before I was uh, Krishna conscious. Even before I came into uh, this ISKCON, at that time also when I used to hear that God-fearing, all the South Indians, whoever I met, they always said, uh, we are God-fearing people and they think that, you know, I will be uh, thinking that, oh, they will be very nice people. But I always used to think, why are they saying God-fearing? Why do they fear God? They should be loving God because... God doesn't want to harm us, they just, He wants us, wants what is good for us. Yes. So, yes, I understand your point. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Any other questions? No? Okay, we'll finish here then. Thank you very much. So, what about tomorrow? I understand no class tomorrow for Ram Navami. Okay, no class tomorrow. All right. So, we'll meet me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Dandabhat Pranams. Hare Krishna. Go back to Vrinda Ki Jai. Ram Nomi Ki Jai. Jai.